Okay, everyone, thank you for coming to uh, Jordan's Defense Seminar. Really excited to have you all here and appreciate you coming in on a Monday after school is out. Um, I know Jordan's really excited to share her results with you. Uh, so Jordan started out on an aquaponics project and really wanted to do some uh, more wildlife focused work and so we kind of created this, uh, this rapid project for her um, and it should be really exciting and it's something that we're all really excited about to see how do rabbits use these agricultural landscapes? And uh, I'm personally really proud of Jordan and the progress that she's made in the two years that she's been here. Um, I think that you could say that you're an entirely different person now than you were when you started. Um, and so really excited to see what she has to say and I'll turn the time over to her. Thank you everybody for being here this morning. Um, before we get started, I just want to acknowledge all the entities that made this research possible, including um, the grants that funded me and my committee and then my small field crew, but my So uh, I uh, focused my research on eastern cottontail rabbits, which are the most widely distributed uh, rabbit species throughout the United States. Um, they have an important ecological role through facilitating plant structure and growth, uh, their feces uh, behavior facilitates seed dispersal and soil fertility, and they are a key prey source for a lot of predators across the country. They are crepuscular, meaning that they are active at dusk and dawn, and they typically are solitary except when mating and when raising young. They prefer areas with dense vegetation for protective cover and uh, herbaceous plants for foraging. However, they are very adaptable to different habitat and food types, which has labeled them a habitat generalist. And despite this, what they do need in a optimal habitat is going to be a protective cover, so escape cover, places where they can um, seek refuge from predators, different foraging options, and then spaces to perform reproductive behaviors and activities. So one of the biggest issues impacting rabbit populations across the United States is habitat fragmentation. And in this part of the country, the biggest driver of fragmentation is the development of agricultural land, which involves um, developing areas of native woodlands and grasslands into uh, crop fields and areas for livestock grazing. And what's left over are these, um, often these small woodland and grassland patches that are uh, sandwiched in between large expanses of crop fields. And so when, um, anecdotally, uh, at least in this area, it's common to see rabbit populations in these small woodland and grassland patches. And they may even be utilizing these crop fields as an additional resource when they're available um, as they grow. However, we all know every year harvest um, inevitably is going to happen and harvest represents a very dramatic and quick change to the landscape and rabbits are going to be forced to either a, um, shift their range away from that area or they can continue to use that area at a higher cost to them. So often when we fragment habitat we create a landscape matrix and so if you can imagine that um, number one in this figure is a native woodland patch. And over time, we start to develop into that. We create ag land, and we uh, start to lose a lot of these connective areas. Um, these fragments become abnormally uh, uh, shaped, and they are disconnected from each other. And as more time and development continues, we start to lose more of this native area, and we're left with um, number three, number three, um, where we have even smaller fragments and they are even more disconnected from each other um, to the point where they may even be isolated. So number three is what um, I would consider a landscape matrix where you have a bunch of uh, native fragments left over in this area amongst other, uh, in this case, crop fields. So small and isolated fragments can impact rabbit populations to certain degrees. A small fragment may not be able to provide the space needed to support a decently sized population because it may lack resources, whether that be space or food, water, shelter. So that may actually force rabbits to move out of this habitat um, to find a different habitat patch that can uh, supply them the resources that they need. Uh, further, 
fragments can be isolated as well as small, and that's going to be when there is a lack of native vegetation surrounding the fragment. So often, um, as this picture here, it could be almost barren, this barren area. And this could actually restrict movement if the fragment is so isolated that the nearest habitat to, for them to travel to would be too far. Um, so they could restrict movement in that that uh, movement would be too risky, so they might not even attempt that. And we can imagine that when we harvest crops, we have, um, we're essentially almost creating this barren area where if they were utilizing those areas for resources, now they are um, not available anymore. And it's potentially this could be isolating their populations. So when individuals are able to move in between and among habitat patches, we would consider that dispersal. And dispersal is going to be necessary for landscape connectivity. And when patchy populations are able to connect to each other across the landscape, we consider that a metapopulation. And so the, conversely to that, if we don't have dispersal or there's not any connectivity between patchy populations, we start to worry about genetic isolation. So if that patch is forced to breed with itself, then we may see a higher inbreeding uh, coefficient. And even further than that, if we were to lose all the individuals in that patch, be it from predation, hunting, or inclement weather, then we could potentially cause local extinctions in these small patches, which may not be a big deal at a small scale, um, just in one patch, but if that starts to happen over the landscape as a whole, then that could eventually create problems for the species. So uh, just to give you a visual of these metapopulations, you can imagine that we have um, three good uh, habitat patches that are supporting uh, decently sized rabbit populations. Because we have connection between these, um, we have these other smaller, not as great habitat types that um, aren't able to house as many uh, individuals. But since we have this connectivity, we can, these individuals can disperse through to a, this habitat patch and um, even further they can disperse out again. However, when we take away this connectivity, um, now we don't have the opportunity for dispersal. Furthermore, if we were to lose an individual in a patch, there's no way for anyone to come in and help recolonize that patch. So in order for there to be connectivity across the landscape, rabbits are going to need to be able to cross this landscape matrix. So they are going to be, need to be able to disperse. And so fragments, the different habitat types can act as uh, stepping stones where they aid in rabbits to connect to another area, or they could act as a barrier where rabbits are actually isolated and not able to move further. And there could be seasonal differences associated with habitat connectivity in this agricultural landscape because we are harvesting crops. Um, when the crops are high, it, they may be providing this additional connectivity versus when they're cut, it could be acting as a barrier. So habitat selection in rabbits. Um, habitat fragmentation is going to force rabbits to prioritize certain habitats over another because some habitats, uh, like grassland, may offer really good foraging, but it doesn't offer a lot of protective cover. And so often there is this trade-off for resources because resources may be mutually exclusive in some of these habitat types. So habitat selection in rabbits is going to be dependent on the landscape matrix, so what is available to them, the resource availability, so what resources are within each of the habitat types, and uh, potentially the season. So, um, growing, I hope that keeps going. <laughs> uh, growing versus non-growing, um, is there a difference in how they're selecting their habitat when the corn is up versus when it is um, not there? And when we talk about habitat selection, um, we often look at different spatial scales. So um, I'll discuss this throughout, but uh, I wanted to introduce you to this idea of a, a second and third order spatial scale. So when rabbits are, a third order spatial scale is going to be when rabbits are choosing um, their home range within a larger geographical area. And then when we move down to the third order, we're looking at how rabbits are selecting their habitat within that home range. So for my research, I had three objectives that I wanted to look at. Uh, I wanted to look at population ranges, habitat selection, and landscape connectivity across this agricultural landscape. 
at um, both the spatial scales, second and third, that I just mentioned. And I wanted to see if there were any differences seasonally, so growing versus non-growing, and then if there are any gender differences. And for each of my objectives, I had a hypothesis uh, for population ranges, I thought that they would be larger in the non-growing season when resources are less available on the landscape and rabbits need to um, travel further to find necessary resources. For habitat selection, I thought that they would be selecting four corn crops in the growing season as they are going to provide a potential uh, additional resource for them. And then connected pathways I thought would be shorter in the growing season when corn can act as an additional connection um, versus the non-growing season when it may be um, restricting movement and acting as a barrier. So here we have a, a map of Nebraska and green is going to indicate cropland and you can see within my study area uh, it's mostly green. My study area is just south of town here in Kearney um, among private agricultural uh, farmland. You zoom into this area, you can um, more clearly see that this is an agriculturally dominated area. And throughout this area, I trapped at six different locations that correlated to six different private properties. And so I will say that there may have been other um, locations throughout this landscape that I could have trapped at. However, uh, these ones were easily accessible and I figured them to be a good representation of what was available on the landscape. So at each property, they, it consisted of four main habitat types. So we have woodland, grassland, cr uh, corn crops, um, was mostly the crop throughout the study site, and then developed areas that either consisted of homesteads, gravel roads, um, or areas of short grass that are regularly mowed and often store, used to store larger farm equipment. And so here I have pictured um, two different, two of my properties Uh, so this one up here, you can see it has a, a little L-shaped woodland patch. There are cornfields across the way. This is the um, house, the homestead. But this uh, is all a grassland area, so it's pretty open. Um, also, this property is the furthest away from town. Um, it's on a dirt road versus um, a paved road, so it's just a little less um, accessible versus this property, which is the closest to town. Um, we still have this woodland um, area. However, in here we have a lot of developed, um, this is where farm equipment is stored, and then we have a bunch of grain silos, and then um, this is all cornfield. So I'm just showing you this to tell you that the fragment size of each habitat type was completely dependent on the property where I was at. So I captured rabbits from November 2017 to June of 2018 was most successful when there was snow on the ground and the temperatures were below 20 degrees Fahrenheit. I set traps at each property where I saw signs of rabbits, so either <coughs> tracks, feces, or actual rabbits. I set the traps in the evening, checked them in the morning, and the baits that were most successful were apples, mixed bird seed, and corn. So upon capture, I would transfer them to a cotton pillowcase where I would sex them, take some basic measurements, and outfit them with a VHF collar which I have pictured here, um, the part that goes around the neck, and then the base of the collar, which is gonna lay on the chest, and then the antenna sticks up out and behind the rabbit. So to, ter to determine where rabbits were, I utilized radio telemetry methodology from November 2017 to January 2019. I located each of my collared rabbits at least once per week. And um, if you're not familiar with this method, it involves going out with a receiver and an antenna and searching for the signal on the rabbit collars. And once you find the signal, you surround the and where you think the animal might be at three or four different locations. So on this figure, the locations would be A through D. And at each of these locations, I would take a GPS position of where I was standing and then a bearing in the direction of the strongest signal. And the idea is that all these bearing lines cross in one spot, and that is where we can confidently say that the animal is. Alongside uh, telemetry methods, I also did vegetation sampling from May of December 2018 within the four main habitat types. And I, did, you, I chose two transects per habitat type for a total of eight transects. A transect is a 100 meter straight um, stretch, and I flagged every 10 meters.
So at every flag, I would place down a one by one meter quadrat and I would sample, survey what was in the quadrat. So I surveyed half of the transects every two weeks, so one per each habitat type. And within the quadrat, I measured the percentage of canopy cover, so what was overhead, horizontal obstruction, so what was um, looking through, and then ground cover composition, so what um, the vegetation was within that quadrat. And then alongside these vegetation sampling samples, I also did pellet counts. And from here on out, um, we didn't really find a lot of significance with the vegetation, so I'm more just going to refer to the pellet counts for um, this talk. So for all three of my hypotheses, I needed to use my rabbit locations uh, that I took in the field. So I put those into LOAS ecological software, which essentially just triangulates for you. And um, where those bearing lines crossed, um, I only used uh, locations that had 25 meters squared area of error or less. Um, from there, I separated my locations by property, season, and gender. I delineated growing season to be May 15th to harvest. Harvest uh, varied based on the property, but it was anywhere from uh, beginning of November to the, sorry, beginning of October to the beginning of November. And then non-growing was harvest to May 15th. From there, um, I took the locations into R, and I used the add habitat HR package. Um, and I only used uh, location categories that had 25 locations or more. And then um, coming back to those spatial scales I was talking about earlier, at the second order spatial scale, I created 95% minimum convex polygons, um, so MCPs. And then at the third order, I created 95% curl density estimators, so KDEs. For my first hypothesis, looking at population ranges, um, I took the MCPs and KDEs and I brought them into ArcGIS and I determined the total area for each population range um, by the season and by the gender. And then I ran a general linear model to see if there were any significant interactions. Um, I tested differences in means using a one-way ANOVA and then um, checked for significance with a 2P Kramer post hoc. So overall, uh, throughout the course of the study, I caught 70 cottontails and collared them. I had 50 males, 20 females. Uh, males outnumbered females at all of my sites except one. And uh, I will say that this is 70 over the course of the study. I had about 30 collars to put out, and at, uh, the most I had out at one time I think was 28. So uh, since they are a prey species, mortality is high for rabbits, so as an individual would die, I would go recover that collar and then replace it on a new animal. So the average population range was uh, about 10.4 hectares. Uh, I didn't see any gender or seasonal differences in population range, ranges. However, there was significant difference between two of my sites. And these are the sites I had pictured earlier. So we have this, um, if you remember, the small one that is condensed and very um, squished between cornfields is going to be the smaller one at an average of two hectares. And then the larger one uh, is about seven and a half hectares, and that was the property that had that significant amount of grassland. Um, and the non-growing season is pictured in blue, the growing season is in green. Um, so just note that the non-growing season in both of these properties is actually smaller than the growing season. So there were any gender or seasonal differences that we saw. Um, it could have been because uh, at one time, uh, 70 over the course of a year is a large sample size, but at one time, um, we didn't always have a large sample size. Um, so it could be that our sample size was too small. And additionally, it could be that we didn't have an, enough locations to capture those differences. Uh, a lot of, most of my locations were taken during the day. So uh, we lack a lot of those nocturnal locations. So it could be that we're just missing some of those differences. Uh, overall, the non-growing ranges were smaller, not significantly, but um, they were smaller on average. And this could be uh, because I believe they are utilizing those corn um, crops when they are available, so they are expanding out into those areas a bit in the growing season. Uh, properties did differ in their habitat size, and this is pretty congruent with research that's already been done on rabbits and also hares that say that their home ranges are going to be dependent on what is available to them on the landscape. So coming back to those uh, spatial scales, uh, I just wanted to give you a visual example of what I'm talking about. So on this left picture, um, I have all of my locations at each of these properties, and I created an MCP 
uh, so a minimum convex polygon around these locations. And so at the second order, remember, we are looking at how rabbits choose their home range within a larger geographical area. And so um, for our MCP in the second order, we're not only looking at each of these um, study sites, but we're also taking into account all of the landscape in between. And then at the third order, we're looking at how rabbits select habitat within their home range. So here, we're zooming into each of these population ranges that um, I determined and um, only looking at within those ranges. So for my second hypothesis, I actually did three different analytical methods to assess habitat selection. Uh, first, uh, I used the pellet surveys that I took alongside vegetation. I grouped the pellets by season and habitat. Um, and then in ArcGIS, I determined the area of each of the habitat type or each of the habitats. I determined the number of pellets within each habitat. And then I created chi-square contingency table and ran chi-square goodness of fit test to determine if the number of pellets within each habitat type differed than what we would expect. Um, and just from the nature of the pellet counts, this was only able to be done at the third order. So here I have the results for that. Um, a minus on this is going to indicate avoidance of an area, plus is going to indicate selection for, and then zero is going um, to indicate not a significant selection for or against a certain area. So we see that annually they are avoiding corn, and then selecting for developed areas annually as well. In the growing season, they avoided grassland, and then in the non-growing season, they selected for grassland and woodland. So they, these pellet uh, results show that they are avoiding corn year-round and selecting for developed areas, um, and I'll touch more on these points later. Uh, in the growing season, they were also avoiding grassland. That could just be because there are other resources available on the landscape that they are choosing. And then in the non-growing season, they are selecting for grassland and woodland. Um, and that could be because woodland is um, going to offer that escape refuge for them. Uh, grassland is probably beneficial in the non-growing season as a foraging area when there is a lack of forage in the other habitat types. Um, we did have a sampling issue with the pellets just because when it snowed, it was very almost impossible to um, do pellet counts under the snow, so we could only do pellets that were on top of the snow, so that could have skewed our results. So for my second analytical method looking at habitat selection, um, I took those KDEs and MCPs and I brought them into ArcGIS and I determined the area <coughs> of each habitat type within each of the population ranges and then I determined the number of locations within each habitat type. And I did this at both the second and third order spatial scales. Um, and then similarly to the pellet counts, I created chi-square contingency tables and did goodness of fit tests to determine if the amount, the number of locations in each habitat type differed than what we would expect. From there, I utilized bond Ferroni correction and confidence intervals to determine selection. So overall, I was able to use 676 rabbit locations. In the growing and non-growing season, both grassland had the highest percentages of locations. In the growing season, it was followed closely by corn and then developed in woodland. In the non-growing season, woodland was second, followed by corn, and then developed. So for these chi-square habitat results at the second order spatial scale, we see an annual avoidance of corn, again, similar to what we saw with the pellets. Um, and then we see an annual selection for developed areas and woodland areas. The only seasonal difference here is the selection for grassland at the, in the non-growing season. So then when we go to the third order, um, we lose some of the strength of our selection. However, we still have them selecting for woodlands in, the, in both seasons. And then in the growing season, they're selecting for developed. And then in the non-growing season, they are avoiding corn. So uh, their selection for woodlands year-round um, could be because, again, they're using these areas as a refuge, an escape refuge. Also, um, anecdotally, most of the rabbit populations that I had across my study site um, seem to use these woodland patches as their home base. And so uh, they seem to retreat back to there, and so it makes sense that they're utilizing these areas year-round. Um, 
their selection for developed areas could be because, um, like I said before, these developed areas offer um, the forage needed because they are regularly mowed. They also are usually used to store large farm equipment, so they have that protective refuge. And um, they're also typically sandwiched in between um, all the other habitat types, so the corn and the native patches, so they're easily accessible. Um, further, they were selecting for grass in the non-growing season, and this could be because um, there is a lack of forage on the landscape in the winter, and even when there's snow on the ground, the grasses in this area um, still grow pretty high, so they can still use that area for forage. Also, research has shown that rabbits breed as, or cottontails breed as early as February, so, um, and females tend to nest in the grassy areas, so they could be um, utilizing these areas as early as February to perform reproductive behaviors. So we, do, we did see an avoidance of corn year-round, um, and at the second order, that makes sense because if you remember, it was so prominent on the landscape compared to um, all the small bits, uh, chunks of locations. Um, however, they do seem to be utilizing it to some degree as a potential resource, as is evident in this picture. I have a collared rabbit here resting in between these growing corn crops. Um, however, she isn't very far in, and what you can't see in this picture is behind me is a native woodland patch, um, which I believe to be their home base at that site. Um, so while they do seem to be utilizing these areas to some degree, they seem to always be within certain distance to an escape refuge um, or that woodland edge. Uh, so another thing to note from this picture is that um, the nearest woodland patch in front is quite a ways away. This rabbit would have to go through a significant amount of corn to get there. So it does seem that corn is acting as a barrier on the landscape to some degree. Uh, when we look at the uh, differences and similarities between spatial scale, we did see stronger selection at the second order, and again that makes sense just because we are sampling a larger area of unused habitat. Uh, we did lose grassland at the third order spatial scale, uh, just meaning that it's not used any more or less than we would expect, um, but overall we did see congruency between spatial scales. So for my third analytic method, I did a resource selection function, so an RSF, and I did a use available framework for this, meaning that I used my um, rabbit locations that I had gotten in the field, and then a certain number of random locations that I generated. Uh, and I wanted to look at a few different covariates to see how they impacted rabbit habitat or resource selection. So I looked at NDVI, which is essentially a measure of greenness on the landscape, canopy cover, distance to roads, and then land cover type. In order to determine how many random points I needed, I did a simulation in R, determined I needed 10,000 points per season. And so then I went into ArcGIS and I took those um, KDE and MCP population ranges. I buffered them based on the average distance between locations, I merged them, and um, I created random points at a 1 to 30 ratio, meaning that for every one used location that I had, I had 30 random locations. Uh, and then I brought in the covariate layers and determined the covariate values for each of the locations. I then went back into R and built a general linear model for um, each of the seasons at uh, both spatial scales and from using those, I was able to determine what um, covariates for each of these categories best predicted rabbit uh, resource selection, and I used those to create my top models. So here we have um, the RSF results at, at the second order. Um, so for the growing season, we see a negative relationship with canopy cover, meaning that as canopy cover increases, the relative probability of use actually decreases. Um, for NDVI, uh, both the linear and the quadratic form were uh, included in the top model. So basically what that means is that um, the quadratic is going to eventually um, pull that line down and 
there's going to be a spot, like a sweet spot, where rabbits are um, choosing an optimal NDVI value, and then as the values go on either side, um, predicted use would decrease. Uh, for roads, as distance to roads increased, uh, predicted use would also increase. And then for habitat types, um, crops was avoided um, in the growing season. For the non-growing season, we see the opposite for canopy cover. Um, so as canopy increases, so does predicted use. Uh, for NDVI, we see um, as NDVI increases, uh, predicted use also increases. And we see the opposite for roads than we saw in the growing season. So as distance to roads decreases, probability of use actually increases. And then for our significant habitat types in the non-growing season, um, we had developed grassland and woodland. So once we go to the third order, um, again, similar to the chi-squared, our selection isn't as strong, uh, but we do see some similar trends. Uh, all three, canopy, NDVI, and roads, had a similar trend as they did in the second order. Um, and then for the habitat type, significance uh, was developed and woodlands were selected for in the growing season. In the non-growing season, um, we had the same trend for NDVI as the growing season here, um, and then crops were significantly avoided, whereas grassland and woodland were significantly selected for. So in the growing season, rabbits selected areas with less canopy cover, uh, with NDVI values um, between 60 and 70, and with greater distance to roads. And it could be that um, in the growing season, since there is going to be more vegetation overall across the landscape, canopy cover is not going to be as important. And once, uh, and same with NDVI, um, just because there is more, um, not only forage on the landscape, but also refuge on the landscape. Um, we did see that avoidance of crops again in the growing season, and then selection for developed and woodland areas. For the non-growing season, rabbit selected areas with more canopy cover, uh, greater NDVI values, and predicted use was almost 100% within three meters to roads. So conversely from the growing season, it could be that canopy becomes more important when there's less vegetation on the landscape. So as refuge and forage go down in other areas, that canopy cover may be more um, sought after. Uh, being right near the roads, um, for at least in my study site, farmers do not practice clean farming, which means that they farm all the way to the edge of their property. They often leave about five to 10 meters untouched next to the road, so native grasses can grow there. So this actually may be a good area for forage um, in the non-growing season when forage is going to be um, decreased across the landscape as a whole. Also, uh, these areas, since they are shorter grassy areas, um, could offer good visibility so they can scan their surroundings while they're foraging. And additionally, uh, at least the paved roads are gonna be salted in the non-growing season, so that could be an additional draw for them. Uh, we do see, again, that avoidance of crops and then the selection for woodland, grassland, and developed areas. So, Thinking about all of the analytic methods that I used for habitat selection, I did see congruency between methods and um, some common themes that stood out. So we did see that woodlands were preferred year-round, and again, this could be because it's acting as their home base, it has that escape refuge for them. They selected for developed areas um, year-round, but also uh, at the third order in the growing season. And again, these areas could offer those additional uh, forage and shelter resources. Uh, they are easily accessible because they are pushed up against other habitat types. Furthermore, um, because they're pushed up against other habitat types, they could be acting as um, a, connective, a connectivity to a new area. So um, <laughs> rabbits may be using these developed areas as stepping stones to get to another habitat type. And then um, we did see avoidance of cordon year-round, um, and then when we went to the third order, we saw avoidance just in the non-growing. Um, so that is going to be after harvest, um, when the resources that maybe were there previously are now gone. <coughs> and so for my third hypothesis, I uh, looked at landscape connectivity, and to do this, I took those same KDE MCP population ranges into ArcGIS, 
um, and I merged them uh, seasonally. Uh, and I did this at the second and third order. From there, I created resistance rasters using the habitat selection results that I got for my chi-square analyses. And I then input both of those into the linkage pathway tool set in ArcGIS to determine least cost pathways and low cost corridors. So here we have um, the connectivity map for the growing season at the third order. So the population ranges are going to be in green. Uh, least cost pathways are going to be these black lines in between the ranges. Uh, roads are outlined in this yellow. And um, the lightest blue is going to be the lowest cost area, followed by the medium blue is the intermediately cost area, followed by dark blue is the highest cost area. A couple things to note from this map. Um, we have this spot where, uh, for whatever reason, we were not able to connect um, all the way between these two population ranges. Um, also, some of these corridors are relatively wide um, in these areas. However, in here and in here, um, they get pretty narrow. So you can imagine if we were to create these corridors and um, we had these narrower corridors, if something were to happen, if something were to block those corridors, then all of a sudden we don't have connectivity anymore between those two pathways. So here we have the non-growing season, um, and I'm sorry, the least cost distance uh, average between these population ranges was about one and a half hectares. Uh, and then we go to the non-growing season, our average least cost distance was actually shorter than the growing season at 1.2 hectares. Um, and here you can see that we do have connectivity throughout. Um, we don't have any gaps where we weren't able to connect. And we do still have some wide areas um, throughout this. However, there are more narrow areas as well um, than seem to be in the growing season. So I didn't show the uh, second order maps because they are very similar to the third order. I uh, saw some spatial scale similarities there. But overall, the non-growing was shorter, which is opposite of what I expected. Um, and I believe this is because in the non-growing season, grassland was actually ranked higher in preference. And so it actually provides more connectivity through those areas than it does in the growing season. The average least cost pathway between both spatial orders um, for the growing season was a little higher than the non-growing season. However, they're both around one and a half hectares. And if you remember, the average population range that I stated earlier is about 10.4 or 10.6 hectares. Um, so just thinking about distance, uh, rabbits definitely could travel those distances between these population ranges, between these habitat types. Um, connectivity could be possible. However, um, like I said, we had those narrow pathways that um, there was no room for fluctuation in those areas, and if something were to disconnect that pathway, then all of a sudden connection to those two, between those two areas is lost. Um, further, we also have all those roads that were um, in that map that would be an issue if we did want to create these corridors. So in terms of management, um, it's going to be important for farmers and managers to continue to maintain their developed areas. As eastern cottontails are very adaptable, we do see them in urban areas. I'm sure you've seen them in your yard throughout town. Um, so they are adapting to these anthropogenic um, habitat types. And so continuing to regularly mow these developed areas, continuing to store farm equipment when it's not in use is going to be advantageous for these rabbit populations across this agricultural landscape. Um, I didn't really talk about brush piles, but I have one picture here. Um, a brush pile is basically where farmers are going to dump all their excess um, branches and wood and whatnot. And so essentially, a brush pile is going to be a dome that is visually impenetrable from all sides. Um, like I said, in most of my sites, rabbits were using woodland patches as a home base. The only exception to that that I saw was in sites that had brush piles. So they seem to be using those brush piles as a home base when they are available. So um, I think it's important to maintain those brush piles on these kinds of landscapes as well. Continuing to preserve the native areas that we have left um, is going to be very important. 
Uh, a lot of development has occurred in this state, but I'm sure more is possible throughout the Midwest um, and these agriculturally dominated areas. It's important that we don't continue to develop into these small patches and we try and preserve these areas, not only for rabbit species, but for other wildlife as well. Um, and then considering habitat corridors uh, would require doing some further research to determine if they are necessary, um, how we would best do them. However, if um, populations are not connected, then that may be something that needs to be uh, investigated further down the line. So for some research that I would like to do, I would like to see done, um, employing GPS collars on rabbits rather than VHF collars while they would be quite, quite more costly, um, they have been successful in large animal movement studies and studies of raptors because they just are going to provide a more accurate location as well as get that full 24-hour spectrum of movement um, as a GPS collar is going to send a location at a certain time period that you specify. Uh, Further, it could be interesting to utilize trail cameras at potential dispersal areas um, that you may suspect rabbits are moving from or to. Um, setting up trail cameras at either side of a potential corridor could help maybe uh, detect some of that long distance movement. Conducting genetic analyses on these patchy populations um, to determine if there are uh, uh, genetic differences between them to see if they are isolated versus if they are moving between and they're connecting and reproducing with each other. If all of this shows that they are not able to connect in these patchy pop, connect these patchy populations in these agriculture, agricultural environments, then the need to um, figure out how to implement habitat corridors and studying those would um, become more pressing. So uh, overall, I did look at three different methods to assess habitat selection, and I did see some um, uh, congruency between methods. There were some common themes of preferences and avoidances. Um, we see that native woodlands and grasslands are really important for these rabbit populations in these patchy environments, and this is pretty consistent with uh, uh, past research on cottontails and other rabbit species that have showed that they will select for these woodlands and grassland patches over other um, habitats when they are available. These developed areas are additionally important, um, potentially because they're adding these additional resources, as well as um, maybe even acting as a stepping stone to get to other areas. Uh, we don't, I had hoped to potentially detect long distance movement, um, maybe catch some dispersal of some of my rabbits. Um, I didn't see any, and so I can't say if these populations are insular or a meta population, um, but that's something that needs to be figured out um, to determine how to best manage these uh, rabbit populations. And then um, people wonder why we want to study a habitat generalist species because they are abundant, they seem to be doing well across these fragmented landscapes. Well, um, keeping an eye on generalist species because they are so abundant and easier to study is going to be beneficial to catch future declines for them. And also, if we start to see issues in our generalist species, that's going to probably indicate that there are going to be issues with our more sensitive species within that ecosystem as well. So keeping an eye on our generalist species is going to allow us to kind of keep an inventory of the entire ecosystem. And with that, I would like to thank you for listening, and I will take any questions. When you did your locations, did you randomize the time of day in which you went out? Yeah, so I started I started doing that. Uh, I modeled it off a different study that had done like a four hour, three, four hour time blocks throughout the day. And so that was my initial study design. Um, once I was kind of more into this project and I hit last summer, I tried to get more, I wanted to get some nocturnal locations. Um, it's kind of creepy out there at night, so I didn't get as many as I had hoped, uh, 
but yeah, I, I, I did try, I did get, I was able to get more like evening locations um, as the study went on, but kind of near that sunrise sunset. Thing. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So at the beginning you said that you captured a lot more males mm -hmm. than females. Do you think that that's uh, accurate um, for the population that's present, or do you think you have a methodology issue that skewed the information or something about the behavior of the rabbits or something? Uh, initially we thought that, um, well, research kind of is showing that dispersal is more of a male trait, and so it's possible that males are um, moving more out of their home, or out of their like home base, um, and so it's possible like they've gotten more males just because they're more likely to move. Um, I'm trying to think of how I could redesign it to better sample. I don't know that based on what I found at the end I would change anything of how I captured. Um, I, females, I did seem to start capturing more females um, as the spring started and like the beginning of the summer. So maybe once um, breeding starts and reproductive behaviors start then they become more likely to move out um, into other areas. I'm not sure. Yes. Um, for your study site, did you uh, look at what the land history was? How many years were the farmers growing um, corn? I didn't. I I tried to look at the like you know longer history than just a couple of years. I don't have, I didn't get any actual data on that. I do know just anecdotally around here, um, they do like two years of corn and then switch it to two years of soy. Um, and so I know that, I know that at least one of my properties was soy the previous year and now then last summer it was corn. Um, so it kind of just depended on the property. And yeah, they seem to do that two year switch. But um, beyond that, I'm not entirely sure of the land history. Okay. Well, I had a second part to that yeah. as well. And I apologize. Um, did you look at kind of the soil profile in the um, farmland? Did you see whether or not it was high compaction that would kind of deter rabbits from wanting to go in there and create homes? Or was that really not considered for this project? It was not considered. Um, that would be really interesting to look at. Um, I didn't look at that though. Yes. Kind of related question. I know you said that there were no differences seasonally, but the cornfield changes pretty drastically from being bare dirt to kind of tree-like. Right. I mean woodland-like when it's full cover mm -hmm. in July. Um, did you do you see any differences at all? Just in you know, when you're out there with your telemetry, like I could see you seeing the rabbits at least in there in the summer versus in the winter not right. being anywhere near that. Do you see any differences over the course of what the plant is doing out there? Yeah, uh, I definitely anecdotally at least can say that they were, when I was going out there, I would often like um, flush out rabbits from the corn even when it was, I mean, like that picture, it really wasn't, it was probably like a foot. Um, so even as early as that, I saw them going out into the corn versus um, in the non-growing season, I really didn't see anything in the corn. Uh, I, I think I had one mortality uh, after crops had been um, planted, but before they started sprouting, I had one mortality that a rabbit was clearly chased um, by a predator into the field, but really I didn't see any any rabbits in the, that area in the non-growing season. Yes? You had the hypothesis that in the non-growing season that their home ranges were going to be larger, and in fact they ended up being smaller. Mm -hmm. Is it that they're really that afraid of predators, that they're just hunkering down because everything's so open at that point? Or what are your thoughts on them? Uh, well, I, I made that hypothesis based on 
other research, other studies, what they have found in that non-growing uh, home ranges are typically larger. I think their behavior is very much based on their um, their instinct to be concealed and hide and um, deter predation. Uh, I, I think it's possible that they could be hunkering down to some degree, um, especially when there's, the landscape is more barren, there's not that, those refuge areas, um, especially if they are uh, locating, their central location is that woodland patch, then they could be um, definitely just trying to stay around there. So that's definitely a possibility. And predators around there, like coyotes and hawks and bobcats, um, foxes. Great one, Alice. Yes. So, I was just thinking about the last two years, and it's been prime seasons for vegetation. We've had lots of rain. What do you think you would see if we had done it, you know, five years ago when we were getting pretty dry seasons? And I mean, do you think that would force them out more? I mean, where they have to travel more and. Um, in the sources in the growing season or just overall overall I mean yeah I mean, you had you had some pretty nice years for rabbits the last couple of years mm -hmm. and it was really easy on them but what if you had a you yeah, said extreme extreme weathers can yeah. make significant impact on rabbits yeah um, I would think that <coughs> populations wouldn't fare as well in those conditions um, especially if the and there's not enough, I mean, I'm not familiar with, I wasn't here five years ago, but um, I would imagine that just vegetation in general wasn't as full, wasn't as optimal, um, so that they would probably, yeah, need to expand more to find those resources, and that could, of course, um, increase their risk of predation, so I would imagine all that would lead them to not fair as well as a population. And my guess is they're probably going to have to go to the crop fields because that's where the water would be. I mean, they're going to have to yeah. utilize that probably more, at least for, not maybe for housing, but for, yeah. <laughs> for water. <laughs> right. Yes. Um, for uh, when you uh, did your pellets, um, would surveying the composition of what these pellets are um, made of, would that help give a more insight into habitat preference? Or is that kind of something that you really can't do at all? Uh, I think if you wanted to do figure out habitat preference from that, you'd have to look at um, the vegetation composition um, like pretty in detail with throughout their whole range. Um, I know that pellets have been used to just determine um, diets and uh, foraging habits. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah.